Are you ready to hoist the colors? Now, time for the most in-depth look at the world of ECU athletics. Welcome in to Hoist the Colors with your host, Stephen Igo on 94.3 The Game. Watch the show live on Facebook and at 94.3thegame.com. Now, here's your host, Stephen Igo. All right, welcome in. Hoist the Colors on this Wednesday, March 20th edition of the program. It's going to be an exciting show because ECU football, spring football is back. We've been previewing it with Bobby Harward the last few weeks, and now it's officially back. We'll get into that. We've got some cuts from Mike Houston to play, also some thoughts from practice. ECU baseball wins again, eight in a row for Cliff Goblin's club. We'll discuss that as they get another road victory last night. And then March Madness is officially here. NIT action last night, first four action. Virginia again lays a giant egg, especially considering I had a bet on them. We'll get into that. We may also introduce our bet of the week segment here on Wednesdays going forward. Philip Pilkington producing Bobby Harward in studio. Bobby, how's it going, man? Going good. Happy to get March Madness kind of in full swing here. Probably one of the funnest weekends of the year, in my opinion, uh, is that first weekend of March Madness. Thursday, it'll get underway. I should mention, by the way, we are uh, scheduled to have John Gilbert tomorrow on the show live in the noon hour here in studio. So uh, if you guys want to submit questions for that, uh, be prepared to join the live stream. Also, we'll probably have a thread up on hoistthecolors.net asking for questions. But we'll be visiting with John Gilbert tomorrow. We'll have basketball on in the studio as well as the tournament will get underway at that time. But it's good to have a bracket, uh, as Bobby and I both have ours on the table. We'll get into that here shortly. We will lead today. It is Hoist the Colors with ECU Talk and Spring Football. And uh, we are still running our 50% off special on hoistthecolors.net. We've had a lot of people subscribe the last 24 hours or so with spring football coverage. We've got VIP practice reports, photo galleries, interviews, and more. 50% off Hoist the Colors. Dot net. So, Bobby, where does spring football, now that you're not in the business anymore as far as coaching or anything, where, where does that fall on your radar? Because I feel like, I don't know, it's, it's somewhat lukewarm for a lot of people. Obviously, I'm in it. I cover it. I'm out there. It's hard for the fans to maybe touch, which is why we cover it so strong to kind of give that feedback. But are you excited for this spring for ECU football? Overall, I would say it varies from year to year, depending on the situation. Uh, this year is probably the highest it's been since I've, you know, been been out of coaching and whatnot. Because uh, even you know, shortly shortly after that was, uh, to be honest, I could care less about right. ECU for the first three years or so. That Scotty Mo era, I was still pretty sour There's about a lot everything. Of people <clears throat> that uh, gradually join you as that yeah. that uh, deteriorated. <laughs> But, um, yeah, this is definitely the most exciting uh, just with the newness of everything. You know, I knew Donnie pretty well, so I had an idea of what the offense would look like year in and year out. And so this is, you know, something brand brand spanking new, which is exciting. Um, you know, it, I love reading for those uh, just plugging hoist the colors. Those practice reports are probably my, my favorite thing, just the little VIP tidbits that are in those uh, reports that come – Every evening, um, and understandably for those a uh, little later now that you have two children reporting, so yeah, it takes uh, a while to get down to <laughs> get the chance to sit down and write. I can't even imagine. I was going to shoot you a, a message yesterday, just poking fun that um, understanding you got two kids and got to put them down and covering baseball. So there's a lot going on this spring for you, but uh, yeah, those those tidbits on um, VIP for spring practice are just awesome. Good insight. Sometimes you get a little video clips and stuff that we can add. You can add to it, and, and that we're able to watch. Yeah, last night was tough because you know practice usually wraps around six, and like you got to go home, dinner, and then it's bedtime. And if I'm just telling the wife. Hey, by the way, you can put the kids down. I, I'm going to write a practice report. I don't think that's going to go over real well. But uh, I was writing until like 10 o'clock, so at least there was basketball on the watch in the background. That's oh, a, for a good sure. time of year. And, and some baseball now. When you get up early in the morning. By the way, did you watch any Padres, uh, Dodgers, the official opening day in Korea this morning? You know, I, I completely forgot about it. I had it in my – 
I knew it was happening right. because I had to set my fantasy baseball lineup. But um, the kids actually slept in pretty good this morning, and I did not set an alarm. So I think I, I, I woke up pretty late uh, just before 8 o'clock, which is probably the latest I've slept wow. in a long Lucky time. You. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So we caught up with Mike Houston after the first practice. By the way, being out there, man, a ton of newness in terms of even how they lined up to stretch and new drills, a lot of cardio-oriented drills with the new tempo, and that was a big emphasis on day one. Mike Houston, here's his opening statement from practice on Tuesday. Awesome to be back out on the field. Uh, just you know, great to be back, back out there with the guys, and uh, just uh, you know, it's an exciting time right now. Uh, I'm sure the guys that were at practice at the beginning, uh, you know, since uh, uh, it's a lot different. Okay, energy was a lot different, uh, pace was a lot different. Um, thought the kids, you know, uh, we were really excited to be out there. Um, I told them, I said, we, you know, we had great effort. I thought they practiced really fast. Uh, now we got some execution stuff uh, that we need to clean up, but that's that's going to be with any first day. But uh, you know, it's just like a breath of fresh air to be back out on the field. So. Uh, very pleased with everything from day one, and now we get to go look at the film and you know correct everything because we can all do things better. You know, coaches, we can do things better uh, Thursday. Players, you know, I told them find things that you can do better on Thursday, but uh, you know we just gotta you know build on each day. But uh, it was just uh, it was good good to be back to get there together. All right, there's Mike Houston. We'll have a couple more cuts for him here in segment one. But yeah, it just. There, there was a lot of newness, and I saw a coach on the field there running from drill to drill. I was like, a little different this year, coach. He was like, yeah, uh, quite a few changes. And I asked him, too, later on, like how you balance keeping your culture but also changing things. And he talked about, hey, you got to continue to evolve. And I think last year was a wake-up call. We talked about that all offseason, Bobby. But, um, you know, change doesn't always mean success is coming. But I think when you have a season like last year, you've got to change some things and I'm certain Ole Miss did some is doing some of the same things, or some of these coaches have done these types of things at, at past stops that are coming into the program now. But what, what do you kind of make of some of the changes in terms of uh, altering, whether it be practice structure a little bit, or drills, or just that sort of thing as spring gets going? I think it's great. I mean, honestly, you know, good good for Coach Houston to reevaluate things and adjust things. It's People got to understand a lot, a lot of times head coaches are pretty stuck in their ways and the really successful ones are the ones that kind of adapt and are able to adjust and self-reflect. Um, hopefully that that adjustment and self-reflection in, in Mike Houston and his practice routine and schedule, you know, turns into wins on the field. There's no guarantee it will happen, but the, I, in my opinion, it's a, a positive sign to move forward um, and making those adjustments. And then with the offense of change and you know the philosophy like you need to adjust your practice to get used to the speed to get used to the conditioning watching some of those clips that you had posted on social media and stuff like i recognize pat and go drill which is like a air raid staple that i'm sure you know they use that old miss and um just to get the blood flowing and warm up and and also those walkthroughs um prior to practice like in a pre-practice period like those are a lot of things that, you know, we utilize under rough here. And it seems that, you know, with some of the uh, crossover in terms of coaching trees, it seems like they're implementing. And the spring practice, man, like the fact that it's just beautiful weather outside and not frigid cold, like it just, I don't know. I'm sure they had a lot of fun out there being that it felt great yesterday. A lot of energy for sure. There's no doubt. A lot of, a lot of big smiles, which was very different compared to the end of practice, <laughs> end of season practices last year. There were not much smiling going on, uh, so that was night and day. All right, the big storyline, of course, and we'll be asking about it basically every day. I'm sure quarterback. We've had the opportunity to visit with Kaden Hauser and Jake Garcia on this program. Two very different guys. I think two very motivated guys. And we asked Coach Houston about how they looked on day one, the two quarterback transfers, and how they split up reps. Here was his response. I thought both of them looked really good. Uh, you know, obviously there's some things that, uh, you know, they've got to clean up, but, you know, both of them I thought displayed uh, good control of the base offense. Uh, I thought both of them, uh, you know, showed uh, the arm talent that they both have. Um, and both of them made some really nice throws, you know, intermediate down the field. Uh, you know, I thought we saw some of the new speed that we have at receiver um, out there today. So, um, you know, today Caton was with the ones uh, and Jake was with the twos. Um, I'm sure that we'll flip that on Thursday. 
uh, and, and just see how they both handle you know that other role. But I thought both of them looked very good today. When we talked to Mike Houston on Monday at tiebreakers, he said basically they would flip a coin to see who went first, and John David Baker echoed the same. So, Kate and Hauser first up. You know, we don't get to see a lot of the team periods, but I, I can tell you both Hauser and Garcia looked the part. I mean, and look, I mean, Mason Garcia did as well, but these two guys, they, they've played, they've succeeded to a certain degree, and uh, they both throw a good ball. Uh, they're both a little bit bigger physically than I thought they were in terms of like how much weight they hold. Uh, they look like they should be able to hold up over the course of a college season. But day one, I'm not going to overreact to anything, and it'll be interesting to see how this develops. But we talked about that too, Bobby, like how to how to handle the reps. And it sounds like it'll be, you know, one day this guy with the ones, the next day the next guy with the ones. Do you feel like that's a good way to do it? Did y'all ever do that under rough, or did y'all more split it throughout practice? Uh, no, we did the same exact yeah. way that they're doing. Uh, the one thing I am curious, I know they said a coin flip. I'd be, did they actually do a coin flip? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, that, I'm, I'm curious as well. I'm a little skeptical on that aspect, but yeah. it, it, regardless, you know, they're going to split the reps and, and pretty evenly. Um, I, I do. That's kind of what we anticipated, like those two guys splitting reps, bringing Raheem Jeter from behind and just kind of keeping him along, keeping him in tune. But, yeah, we did the same thing specifically with Shane and, and Rio. Like, you know, you just flip-flop each day. That way everybody feels like, you know, they have a fair chance and everything is on tape anyways. Uh, I'm going to echo what you said. Like, looking at the pictures, that was the first thing I noticed was they were a lot bigger and thicker than I thought yeah. they were. Um, so that, like, looking at Hauser's lower body, like his legs were, were pretty solid. So I was like, oh, wow, he's he's a little bit heavier than I thought. And like you said, can sustain some of those hits as a quarterback. Like that's important, especially if you're going to take off and run some and, you know, get outside the pocket. Like having a, a bigger body that's able to take contact is, is crucial. Not quite DJ Burns thick, but definitely thick. <laughs> Not quite <laughs> DJ Burns, which speaking of, I yeah. listened to Kaysen's story time yeah. yesterday. I think the thing that amazed me about that whole story time was the fact that he slept in until like 11 a.m. Yes. Like hearing that was really what made me double take, <laughs> more so than even driving yeah. to D.C. and back. He um, constantly is – he looks like he just w wakes up when he shows up <laughs> to this show. He's like rubbing his eyes when he walks into the studio. But, hey, he's living that – college student life you can't know? blame him live it while you can no doubt i think this is his last semester so he's got to enjoy it while he can all right final cut here from coach houston we talked about all the newness the energy and you know it just seemed like he was able to hit the reset button to a degree and and, and we asked him or one of the media members there asked him like you know hey why are you so excited is there an extra anticipation this year given all the change and turnover and here was his response to close out the press conference i'm just excited I'm excited about the direction of our program, and I'm, I'm ready to get the nasty taste out of my mouth, and so that's what I'm excited for. I appreciate these kids. Uh, I'm excited about our new coaches. I'm excited about our returning coaches. I appreciate our donors that have really you know, stayed behind us and uh, really been committed to our program, and so my excitement is for you know, getting Pirate football back to where we all want it to be and, and exceeding you know, anything we've done here the past several years. All right, there's Mike Houston and uh, Bobby. When you hear, you know, look, it's the off season. The hype train will be in full force. But like, I, I do feel like there is some substance to what he's saying, and it's not just you know a bunch of fluff. Uh, what, what do you kind of make of his statements there about getting that nasty taste out, taste out and wanting to move forward? Yeah, I think you know you know all the off season moves that you're making as a head coach and all the changes that you kind of anticipate, but it doesn't really seem real until spring practice actually starts and. You get out on the field. You see your new roster. So up until that point, you're kind of just like, you know, you're you're uh, relating it to. I guess we'll we'll put it in the analogy of a book. Like last season was its chapter, and you're at the last page, and you're just waiting to turn that page to turn to the new chapter, and you're just kind of sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. So now finally, you feel like you can move on. Um, and I think that's kind of what he's getting at. Like obviously. He felt the pressure from the community, from the fan base, and just he knew it himself. Like, we had a terrible year, and it was unacceptable by any standards of college football these days. So being able to finally 
turn that page and get on to something new with, you know, you got to feel good about the additions that you brought in and getting to see them out on the field and how they'll start to fit and how, you know, your new OC that you hired, what is that, what is he going to look like out on the practice field? Like all that newness has to be exciting. Um, and just, yeah, being able to move on from just su- such a sucky season. And I'm sure there were a ton of sleepless nights and like all the hours he had to put in, you know, to, to try and fix it. And now you're right. You finally start to actually realize that. I'm sure, you know, there's probably some emotion in that. And obviously that will take take place and, uh, you know, continue to evolve over the offseason. All right, we got to get a break in. Uh, Bobby Harwood today brought to you by Sup Dogs. You guys know the deal. Best bar, multiple time winner of the Barstool Best Bar in America for college uh, best bars. So 213 is East 5th Street, downtown Greenville. They do an incredible job supporting East Carolina athletics. They're heavily involved in Team Boneyard, uh, and they support this show and 94.3, the game as well. And we'll also have the return of Sup Dogs live on Thursday, 6 o'clock. Me and Macy O'Donnell will be there tomorrow uh, to bring back that show at 6 o'clock. That'll be streaming on the ECU Sports Network on social media apps. All right, we'll get a break in. We'll come back. We'll do a very brief special teams preview for spring football. We've done offense and defense. We'll look at special teams. We'll also talk baseball, and then we'll get into March Madness and see who Bobby has cutting down the nets at the end of the year. This is Hoist the Colors. It's time to get more in 24 at Greenville Toyota. More savings, more selection, more for your trade. Get new Camrys, $269 a month, or new RAV4s, $299 a month. Save big and get more in 24 at Greenville Toyota. Acre Station Meat Farm, along with Lane Angus Beef, bring you Farm to Fork Beef. Stock your freezers now with affordable beef boxes just in time for the grilling season. Farm to Fork Beef brings quality local beef to your family. From your traditional butcher shop, Acre Station Meat Farm. Come on down to Acre Station Meat Farm and find out why we're number one in fresh cuts and friendly service. Acre Station Meat Farm, Highway 32 North, Pine Town. Other restaurants claim their food is fresh and fast, but are they friendly? At Moore's, you're treated like family the minute you walk into their doors. With locations in Winterville, New Bern, Swansboro, Moorhead City, and Jacksonville, we've been practicing what we preach since 1945. At Moore's, our barbecue is slow-cooked and smoked over real wood daily until it's so tender it's falling off the bone. Combined with our fresh chicken, cooked-to-order seafood, and homemade fixins, we're sure you'll agree, if it's not Moore's, It's less. You know what the problem is with standard belts? Usually you have to choose between too tight or the opposite, too loose. But with Anson Belt and Buckle, you don't have to choose. We got rid of the holes and instead have a track system designed for micro adjustability. That way you can enjoy a perfect fit every time. Anson Belt and Buckle. Find your perfect fit today. enjoy it just as it is that was our inspiration behind bow coast west our newest community in beaufort north carolina embrace all that we love about this very special place and make it easy for families to enjoy all that this coastal lifestyle has to offer be inspired bow coast west Get more in 24 at Greenville Toyota. Get more savings on our huge Toyota selection. Shop new Corollas, just $239 a month. Or new Tundras with 3.99% financing. Get more for your trade. Save big and get more in 24 at Greenville Toyota. This is ECU head football coach Mike Houston, and you're listening to Hoist the Colors on 94.3 The Game. All right, welcome back in. Hoist the Colors on this Wednesday. We'll get into special teams 
preview here in a second with Bobby Harward as we round out our spring football preview now that it's underway. We've done offense and defense the past few weeks. Wanted to hit on baseball. So I was kind of in and out following this game. But after three consecutive one-run midweek affairs, the Pirates had a comfortable and easy midweek win, 10-1 to at Elon. They took care of business on the road. By the way, all four midweek games at this point, true road games. They're now 2-2 two and two in those contests, 5-3 and three in true road games, 10-1. to one. Uh, Philip, you produced this game, correct? Yep. So I may lean on you a little bit here. But, you know, being in and out and listening, I, I was not able to watch. Chris Kaler, five innings, only gave up one run on a solo home run. When you get that type of pitching in the midweek, that's a big deal. But any big takeaways from you as you produced and, and followed this game as the Pirates got the victory? You know, I've always been one that I think if you have the staff to do it, you should have four starters. You should have a midweek starter, especially with ECU having so many big RPI boost games in the midweek due to our lackluster conference that went like 1-10 in 10 yesterday with the Pirates on being the only victor. And because of that, I was really impressed with Chris Kaler. You know, you mentioned the five innings. Well, he only threw 60 pitches. And Coach Godwin has made it very clear, I think, with the way he's managed Chris Kaler, that he wants him to be a midweek starter, but to throw a little enough pitches to pitch on the weekend if needed. Well, he did that and still got the win. He got behind in some counts early, and he still battled back. He got a lot of fly ball outs, lazy fly ball outs. He only had, I think, three ground ball outs out of his 15 and I think one strikeout, and pretty much everything else was just a lazy pop fly. Um, There was a couple, I guess, hard hit balls, but he he did give credit to Bristol Carter for a home run that I think it was going to rob home run. I didn't see it, but it was darn close if not. But he pitched to contact. He did not pitch around hitters, and he proved that he can be the midweek starter. And if something comes up in a regional or if one of our other guys has to miss a start, I feel very comfortable slotting him into that weekend role. It was phenomenal. I think um, going to the bats, this team hit up and down the lineup. There was not one guy out there with four or five hits yesterday. A lot of different guys hit the ball. It was good to see, you know, Coach O and I were talking about this, where, you know, it's the unwritten rule of baseball. You never DH your backup catcher. Well, McChrystal has earned a spot in the lineup every day. Says a lot about him. Says a lot about Coach Godwin's confidence in Walker Barron as well that if J-Dub would have to come out of the game that he could slot Barron into that spot and not be worried about losing that DH spot and having to move McChrystal over I think it was the best game they've played all year and Coach Godwin said that after the game as well yeah a lot of good defensive plays through strikes and you know really kept a pretty good offensive Elon team down I mean they struggled defensively and pitching obviously three errors last night for Elon but ECU took advantage of those Justin Wilcoxon, who we had in on Monday, two for five with an RBI double. Carter Cunningham, two for four. He extends his hitting streak to 19 games. He's hit safely in every game this season. He did go 0 for four in last year's finale against Virginia, so it is just a this season hit streak. But I think the record of ACU is 32, held by Bryant Packard. So Carter Cunningham more than halfway there. So big win, 10 to one. At Elon, Pirates eight in a row, 15 and four overall. Go to UTSA this weekend. And yeah, I'm just not to underplay the conference because it, it'll be, it, it's never easy for ECU because they're the clear cut best team. They're ranked, they're going to get everybody's best shot. But I mean, you mentioned it, Phillip. Nobody else in the conference won last night, and basically everybody played, which is just sad. And a lot of those games were against winnable teams. So, like, the conference has got to help ECU out, man. This, otherwise, this is going to be another frustrating year where ECU wins 40-plus games and isn't hosting because of the league. No, I agree. And, you know, it, it's crazy to say, and I'm going to sound like an idiot for saying it, but in a perfect world, ECU would be allowed to jump ship from the American in, it, in baseball only. I mean, you know, Army and Navy play – football only in the American. Dallas Baptist is not even a D1 school, and they're playing CUSA baseball. But they're D1 in baseball, but they're not D1 in other sports. In a perfect world, we should be allowed to move conferences. Okay, like, at least Gonzaga has St. Mary's, and they used to have BYU until last year, who's always a French tournament team. And San Francisco's not bad. Like, we are getting punished for showing up to games. And now, I don't put too much stock in RPI, But 
I think the committee does a lot, and our RPI is in the mid-20s right now. We are not the 25th best team in the country. We're way better than that. Coach O started building this program to be a Omaha contender. Then Coach LeClaire continued that. Then Coach Billy Godwin. It didn't go as well as the previous two, but he still had a winning record here. They were still a good team, and now Coach Cliff Godwin has gotten this team to host a Super Regional to be a national seed. And part of the reason I think this team hasn't broke down the door to Omaha is because they're not battle-tested in the back half of the season. Coach Godwin does everything he can to schedule tough out-of-conference opponents. But, yeah, we're playing Duke late in the midweek, but when you're going out there playing these bums, yeah, you're going to lose some games because that's baseball. This isn't football where, like, Vanderbilt can't beat Alabama. Like, yes, you can lose, but this conference is doing a disservice to this program right now. Yeah. Casey Romaley says Charlotte is not good, which is going to hurt, speaking of baseball. So, yeah. I don't know. We could, we could do a whole another show on conference realignment and that sort of thing. Um, let's switch gears. And talk or you could, ask, uh, what? you could ask Gilbert tomorrow about conference realignment. That is true. John Gilbert, ECAD. I will ask him about conference realignment, and I'll ask him, how does ECU prepare itself to join the ACC if – what we think about to take is about to take place takes place. I don't know what his answer will be. I'm sure to some degree he has to be politically correct yeah, because he can't sure. just be like, we want to bail on the AAC. AAC. I mean, uh, it's a question you have to ask, but I don't think it's going to be an answer right. that we're going to want to hear. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, to your point, like all that stuff is closed doors. I will say this, I believe the last two times he's come on your show and a similar question has been asked or in a roundabout way, he has given an answer that is very political, but something normally happens a few days later that's right. spot on to what he yeah. is kind of hinting at. So tune in tomorrow. No doubt. And uh, there was also a show where he just took his phone and read questions straight from the Hoist the Colors awesome. message board. I didn't even have to ask him anything. So <laughs> I'll at least ask him some things tomorrow. Uh, 12 noon, John Gilbert will be in. All right, brief special teams preview. Just because I feel like we're obligated to do it. We did offense, defense, and hey, like Ruff McNeil used to said, all three sides of the ball, right? Kickers need love, too. That is true. And ECU does have a pretty solid kicker returning. Andrew Conrad had a good year last year. I feel like he's pretty automatic from 40 in. I think he missed maybe one last year. He's got a game winner under his belt at BYU. So I feel pretty good about the place kicking competition, Bobby. Uh, what do you think about you know that aspect of special teams? That's probably the most the the in in regards to special teams. That's where I'm probably most comfortable with yeah. in, in terms of next year. I think there's a lot of other questions in other places, including a new special teams coordinator. Um, and does the scheme change? Do they keep the scheme similar? Do they now that they have a special teams coordinator? Do they? function in a similar way that they have in the last few years where you know some of the assistants are responsible for a team or is the special teams guy taking over it all so andre powell is the new special teams coordinator comes by way of pittsburgh he's also spent time in north carolina syracuse clemson in recent years uh, he spent the last nine years at pitt essentially they traded him for tim douse as tim douse is now the defensive line coach at pittsburgh uh, andre powell so he will be the coordinator he will not be officially an on-field coach. So I think they're still going to do kind of the – each position, you know, coach has a role to uh, for the most part. And then Andre Powell is going to game plan, going to really dive into here's what we need to do. Here, You know, he's going to spend a lot of time with the kickers, the specialists specifically, and the game planning and uh, uh, the schemes. So I kind of like that aspect of things because he's not going to be worrying about other positions. He's going to be fully in on special teams. Yeah, I do too. Um, you know, pretty close with Ryan Doherty, former ECU punter who's out at uh, Southern Cal. And I know they do the same thing there and have done the same thing for a while. Like he is their special teams guy. And, and a lot of other big programs that have had the financial capabilities to pay you know, kind of a special teams coordinator to not be an on the field coach. Like, I'm glad that, you know, we're doing what's necessary and providing the financial resources to be able to get that position here. So Mike Houston told me that and told us on Monday that when he was a high school coach and, and Powell was at UNC as special teams coordinator, that Powell would sometimes keep him in the guest room uh, as, a, as a house guest. And uh, Mike Houston would take a lot from him as he, when he was doing clinics and that sort of thing. So they, they have a relationship that goes a long way back. And 
Coach Houston has sent a lot of his special teams coach to learn under Powell, like in the off season. So I think what you have here is a long standing relationship. Things worked out. He was able to come to ECU, and a lot of the schemes ECU has been running are probably similar to what Powell is running. So I feel like that transition is going to be pretty seamless. You'll probably see a few tweaks, Bobby. But the biggest thing for Powell will be learning the personnel and the names and you know how to determine who is on kickoff coverage, punt coverage, punt team, that sort of stuff. So I do feel like even though he's getting in kind of late, uh, it'll be a pretty pretty smooth transition. I would think so. And, you know, this spring is going to give him an idea of, you know, where to where to place people. And, you know, obviously there's not – there are some staff changes, but most of – especially defensive staff where a lot of your special teams players come – you know, that core, that staff has been retained, so they'll be able to help him fill in like, all right, these people were on kickoff team last year. This is, you know, they did an excellent job. We can try to keep them there. Maybe these guys are moving up on the depth chart, so maybe we need to pull them off at least one of the special teams, but keep them on another one. You know, just some of those conversations, but really this spring is just going to give him a chance to get a lay of the land and, and see who fits where. Luke Larson is back as the team's punter. I just feel like ECU has not gotten the consistent punting results. You know, the net punt has actually been pretty good, but like distance um, and you know, like net return, I should say, like the net distance and the total distance. So uh, he will get first crack at it, but I would like to see more competition there. I know they're bringing in some more guys, but um, that is a unit that I think can improve. That's my biggest question mark. The fact that there's not enough competition there concerns me. Um, I think, honestly, since this unit and this punter have been in place, I feel like there's been a lot of issues for the last two years. Um, so I hope that maybe they bring in somebody this summer. I don't know. But if they don't see what they like in the spring, uh, maybe – uh, Coach Powell can unlock some potential there and, and maybe make some adjustments. But again, yeah, I'm just I'm really concerned about this group in that position because you know we always treat it as our punt team is the first play of the defense for that series. Like that is your first down. You want to go down and cover the the punt, obviously, but also create good field position. So when you're not giving hang time for your team, your punt team to get down there, or if you're kicking it out of bounds, or if you're kicking it short, like it just really sets up your defense. Uh, and puts them in a bad spot to start the next series. It'll be interesting if they try to add a transfer punter this offseason. I know that they did add the App State uh, transfer, but he has never, I think, punted in a college game. And then they are bringing in a freshman, to, so we'll see what happens with that competition. You have Alex Harper back as the long snapper, who should start uh, with Colby Garfield moving on to another school. Um, so, yeah, I mean, return game. Uh, briefly we'll touch on that Winston Wright coming in it'll be interesting to see what his role is he was an all-conference return man at West Virginia three touchdowns I think and you know then got injured he got the injury at Florida State do you put him back on special teams do you put Javius Bond back on special teams I feel like there's some explosiveness there some potential there but it's like what you know what's the risk factor of your return man like is it worth it that's the one I'm excited yeah. about. Yeah, I'm excited about Winston Wright, and I yeah I put him back there. Yeah. Um, especially if he's if they get a good feel for him in the spring, he seems to be healthy. Definitely, yeah, you put him back there. Um, maybe it is something you have him and Bond compete, but those are two pretty good guys uh, back there to compete for a return position. Like, is the last time we returned one still Lance Ray against App State, or has there been one? Tyler Sneed took one back. Okay. against South Florida. Yeah, that's no. right. Yeah, but the punt there has not been a punt return for a touchdown at East Carolina since Travis Williams in I think 2004. It has wow. been 20 years. Wow. Yeah, I know Justin Hardy got close a few times, just didn't have that uh, speed to kind of finish it. <laughs> finish it. Malik yeah. Fleming was the same way; like he would bust a few, but then get tracked down. Yeah. And punt returns a little different because you want a guy that can sh- secure the catch, mm-hmm. and you really want a guy that has great vision because. Everything gets cluttered a lot quicker yeah. than it does on the kickoff return. You still want a guy with great vision on a kickoff return, but it's a little bit more clear, kind of the lanes that are opening up and et cetera. But, yeah, you know, maybe you have one where if, in my head, maybe Bond is your deep returner on kickoff and Winston Wright can return punts. You get something like that. That way you can get both of them on the field but are not necessarily overusing them. And also kind of historically, running backs – can't catch as well as receivers. Kickoffs are a little bit easier to catch than punts, so maybe it works out in that re- in that way. 
All right, Chuck's got a question and wants us to know about any more defections from the <clears throat> basketball team. Uh, we'll hit on the basketball portal briefly on the other side. No defections beyond Brandon Johnson just yet, but I expect more changes. We'll touch on that. And we'll get into March Madness. We'll see who Bobby has winning the championship as we turn our attention to basketball. This is Hoist the Colors on a Wednesday. Hi, I'm D.R. Alligood. And I'm his daughter, Jessica. For 11 years, we have built quality driveways and parking lots for both your residential and commercial needs. We also offer free on-site quotes to have your custom driveways built the way you want. 252-946-1227. about you, your family, and the health of all who live in Eastern North Carolina. This is about the transformation of a health system into something more powerful and more human, about creating new ways to treat disease and keep you well. This is about ECU Health, which is to say, it's really all about you. ECU Health, minds, hearts, purpose. Fifth Street Hardware is the home of the $9 lunch special Tuesday through Fridays. $9 specials every day, including the famous Burger Day on Tuesdays, Flatbread Pizza Wednesday, the famous Fifth Street Hardware Reuben on Thursday, and Fried Fish or Shrimp on Friday. Plus, trivia on Wednesday nights and live music every Thursday nights. And the Prime Rib Brunch Buffet has returned on Sundays. You heard that right. The Brunch Buffet with all the great items, including Prime Rib, 5th Street Hardware in downtown Greenville. Your confidence makes everything look good. You see the world in vivid color, not black and white. Swing through your neighborhood fantastic Sam's Cut in color. And let our experienced stylists take you from everyday to extraordinary. Fantastic Sam's hair salons are locally owned and operated. Our full service salons are conveniently located in Goldsboro, Kinston, Greenville, Newburn, Jacksonville, and Calabash. Stop in today at Fantastic Sam's where the possibilities are endless. Hi, I'm D.R. Alligood. And I'm his daughter, Jessica. For 11 years, we have built quality driveways and parking lots for both your residential and commercial needs. We also offer free on-site quotes to have your custom driveways built the way you want. 252-946-1227. The Pirates play here. Arr! This is Hoist the Colors Radio with Stephen Igo. Yes! That was so good! 194.3, the game. All right, welcome back. Hoist the Colors on this Wednesday. It's time to talk some hoops. We've talked spring football and more. Chuck wanted to know any more defections from the basketball team. So, I, I think... Obviously, the only announced affection at this point has been Brandon Johnson, correct? That's and, correct. Uh, he got a lot of attention. Bobby Harvard with us, Philip Pilkin to produce him. So he's getting a lot of attention in the portal. I don't know when other announcements will come. I do expect other announcements to come. The portal is open for the next 43 days. Plenty of time to get in there, assess your paperwork and all that sort of stuff. So... Um, or put together that, assess your options. So I think that's being done. But I, I expect a pretty significant number to ultimately hit the portal bobby and i'm not going to say a complete overhaul and rebuild but a pretty large rebuild on the way for schwartz i think it needs to be yeah, yeah. I, I think we're kind of at that point he he you had mentioned this on the board he had kind of tried it his way of wanting to roster build and kind of like what we saw with coach houston and football like hey i need to change so hopefully it, it you know, he does change, and we do see quite the roster turnover. I mean, it, it sucks, but it's the way college athletics is right now. Like, you, you're able to just kind of, in a way, pick and choose. Now, granted, we probably won't get those – definitely won't get those first-tier options and probably not the second-tier, but 
hopefully you can find some third or fourth tier guys. And I think Kaysen mentioned this yesterday, like they need to do a really good job of weeding between everything and, and finding those guys that have slipped through the cracks and finding those guys. I agree with what both of y'all said and that I would rather have a proven guy from a lower level than I would kind of a guy that uh, was maybe a higher recruit or whatever and at an ACC school or SEC and then coming back down. Like To me, those are just crapshoots. I'd rather a guy that's proven and wants to prove himself at a higher level like he's done it before. It'll be interesting, and we're already seeing several targets as far as guys that East Carolina has reached out to. At some point, we'll try and have a show when it becomes more apparent what the roster returning looks like, what the needs are. We'll kind of dive into all that when it becomes more clear. I I believe we're going to have Coach Schwartz on the show next week, potentially Monday, but we're still working on that. Uh, So that should be a a, a definite uh, interesting interview to get his take on what happened this season. Uh, when he joins the program. All right, Bobby, again, brought to you by Sup Dogs today, 213 East 5th Street. Head to Sup Dogs for uh, the Sup Show tomorrow and also the NCAA tournament. And, Bobby, let's find out. We kind of ran through the bracket yesterday, and Philip and I can, can recount some of that if anybody missed it. But uh, let's hear your take on – just the bracket in general, do you have any – we'll start with the, the first round. Any notable upsets from higher seeds or any higher seeds moving on pretty deep into the tournament? Yeah, I got a uh, South Dakota State beating Iowa State. So the last three years, a 15 has beaten a 2. So that is my choice for that. I was kind of down to that or uh, Western Kentucky and Marquette, but I think uh, Marquette is a better team than Iowa State, so that's why I went there. Um, I got Charleston over Alabama, I think – Charleston's a quality team. Um, I know a lot of people have been picking New Mexico and Clemson over Clemson, but because of that, I actually went with Clemson because I think that normally the lower seed has the advantage because there's no pressure on them. Well, I think now with it being kind of more public that an 11 is going to be to six, I think that puts more pressure on New Mexico. And then I got Mr. Will Wade, number 12 McNeese State, beating Gonzaga. I got some other stone in there, but those are probably the ones that stand out the most. McNeese State, definitely a popular pick, but I just think they're really good. I mean, not that New Mexico isn't. It, it is that reverse cost psychology situation where it's like if everybody is on New Mexico, how much is Clemson, you know, using that as fuel right. or whatever? Um, I thought the same thing would happen with UVA last night, so I picked them to beat Colorado State, and that worked out great. They yeah, scored I did 14 the same points thing. in the first half. I, I, they were the first leg of a three-leg parlay, and that's already in the trash. So yeah. thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Tony Bennett, and your terrible offense. Hey, Bobby, I think you were smart to run with Marquette and not make them the two to lose because you can't bet against Shaka in the tournament. I know Marquette's playing their worst basketball of the year, but you know Shaka's going to turn it on come tournament time. He always does. I've got Marquette and Houston in the Elite Eight, but I, I just I feel like one of them is going to lose before then. What's your take on JMU? Do you have them beating uh, Wisconsin in the first round? I have them beating Wisconsin. I have them beating Duke. I, don't, I think Duke just is not all there. I kind of considered putting Vermont – as an upset over Duke, but I didn't want a Vermont JMU matchup. Um, I don't love Wisconsin. I don't love Big Ten basketball really in general. Um, in that bracket as well, I got uh, Case and Romaley's Wolfpack going to the Sweet 16. I just couldn't come to terms with them beating Marquette. To Phillips' point, I'm a big shock, a smart fan, and, and I think they go on a little run here until they run into Houston. Kaysen is tuned in on YouTube. He just asked where you got the pack. You just answered that. He's got the Wolfpack winning the national championship. So, oh, man. <laughs> to his defense, like he was in he was in the locker room after the game, and uh, he experienced all that firsthand. Absolutely. So, like, I get it. And to be honest, I mean, crazier things have happened. Um, well, so I wanted possible. I wanted to pick NC State to win, and then you got an Elite Eight matchup against Houston, which brings back whatever that what is it the eighty three season yeah. where they played each other. I just – I didn't have the guts to to put him there. I wanted to, but I, I just couldn't come to it. All right, Chuck says uh, – he's asking Kaysen a question on uh, YouTube. I guess we can answer it too. He says, do you think FAU can go to the Sweet 16? So, they would play UConn in the second round. That would be an incredible second-round game. There's some awesome second-round matchups potentially, and FAU-UConn would be one. 
you know, I'm torn on FAU guys. Like, I watched them several times this year. I watched more American basketball just because of covering ECU. You really want to get a feel for the conference. And honestly, man, they looked extremely beatable all year. You know, definitely when ECU played them, even when they were at their best at times during the regular season, they looked vulnerable to me. But it's like, were they just going through this season being like, let's just get to the tournament? You also have the rumors of their coach possibly going to Louisville or elsewhere. So, I don't know. I'm torn on FAU. Do you think they have what it takes to make another run? That was one of mine that I was, you know, on the fence between. I wanted to pick FAU, and I just, again, I couldn't come to bring myself to it because, you know, I think guard play will probably match up pretty similar. I, I've worried about UConn's big man being able to take over. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Got a frog in my throat. Frog's back. It's back. <laughs> um, all that pollen out there, it just it's brutal, gets to man. you. So, yeah, I... I I would not be surprised, but I just couldn't bring myself in the bracket to, you know, we're betting serious money on this. So right. I was like, Huge all right, money. I better be on the on it. Which at least we can do it legally now. Uh, Philip, what do you got as far as FAU? Can they beat UConn? I mean, can they? Of course. Of course <laughs> they Will can. Will they beat UConn? Will they? <laughs> Look, I thought coming into the year, FAU was a little overrated. Um, I think they're a good basketball team. I think they got hot at the right time last year, and I think the seed in which they were given shows their talent level. A lot of people had them, you know, preseason top 20, saying they're going to be like a four seed. No, look, they're an 8 9 team. And it always seems like there's one one that doesn't make it out of the first weekend. FAU probably is the most qualified to do that as far as the recency bias. Of course, Michigan State is also in an 8-9 game, and they have Tom Izzo. FAU doesn't, but I'm picking the Huskies in this one. I think FAU gives them a run. I don't think this is one of those where the one cruises to the second weekend. They win both games, you know, the first game by 50 and the second game by 30, but I'm going to go with the Huskies. Just a potentially great second-round matchup. Of course, Northwestern could easily win that game too, which always makes it tough with the – like picking – like if FAU gets by UConn, they could easily make the Final Four. It's just – are they even going to play UConn? Because they could also lose to Northwestern. So those games are always tricky. Um, so you have, what, well, you got UConn emerging out of the East? You got UConn out of the East. Yep, I do have Drake into the Sweet 16. That's kind of my my pick there. And I got Illinois and UConn in the Elite Eight. I don't love Illinois, but I, I'm not, I hate BYU just in all aspects of that university. So I, I put Illinois in the Elite Eight. Are you picking BYU to beat Duquesne? I am, yep. Duquesne's bad, man. I watched. Hey, did you watch the, the A-10 final? I got the Dukes. I didn't know, but uh, I know the A-10 had a ton of awesome tournament games. They did. Uh, so, I can already count all this before the game. Like, they looked really bad. Like, if VCU doesn't have that scoring drought at the beginning of the game, no way in heck Duquesne wins that game. Now, however, Duquesne's hot. I'll give them that, but that team is not good. I, I think they're way overseeded in 11. That'll be an interesting matchup, and people say BYU is underseeded, so the BYU is a pretty heavy favorite there. All right, in the West, I feel like UNC's got the easiest path to the Final Four for a number one, outside of the fact if they get to the Sweet 16, they're going to have to be playing in L.A. and not on the East Coast. That's why I have St. Mary's beating them in the Sweet 16, but I know you have the Tar Heels going pretty far. I do have the Tar Heels. I have the Tar Heels winning it. Um, yep, I am a UNC student, so I have picked the Tar Heels to win. Um, I so do. If you were not a UNC student, would you have? No, nah, I don't think so. Else? I don't think so. Well, what I do like is the fact that they lost to NC State in the championship game. I feel like that was good for them. I think they were starting to get a little too comfortable with themselves, and this gives them a chance to kind of recalibrate and get ready for the tournament. I am a little worried about that Mississippi State game, that second round. I, I feel better about the Sweet 16 matchup than I do. I have Mississippi State winning. Um, and, of course, that Elite Eight match could be fun. Caleb Love in Arizona versus UNC. Uh, yeah, so I, I got a, a message, by the way, from some betting company, Bet365. UConn is the most popular pick across all our states except in North Carolina and in Kentucky where fans remain loyal to their squad. Big surprise there. So <laughs> you, you, you fit into that category. Now that this is a bad pick, I do like the, you know, the reasoning. I've got Houston winning it all for the same uh, reason. Chuck – said what's my final four my final four chuck is houston tennessee arizona yukon all right other side of the bracket quickly who do you have in the south advancing to the final four? i have houston yeah if i didn't pick unc i'd have probably picked houston to win um out of the south and then the midwest i have purdue 
How far do you have Tennessee, and what do you think about the matchup of two teams, Tennessee, Purdue, potentially that can't get it done in the postseason on a you know pretty regular basis? Yeah, I almost had Tennessee losing to Creighton. I got Creighton in the Sweet 16, um, but I, I just couldn't bring myself to have Tennessee lose there. I don't love the fact that I have Purdue going all the way to the one, but I just with some of the upsets that I had on that side of the bracket, like I have Samford beating Kansas and McNeese State beating Gonzaga, I just didn't see Purdue losing to either of those teams. Philip made a great point yesterday that if Kansas survives the first weekend and gets some of those guys back – they could easily beat Purdue. and, and Well, I said that before, and it was officially announced that what's-his-name's not going to be back, oh. um, the guard. So yeah. Dickinson, they're optimistic about, but uh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? They've said he's out for the whole tournament. So. I feel like they could still make a run, but it's going to be tougher with that news. All right, let's get a break in. We'll come back, and we'll try to come up with our bets of the week. I'm assuming they're going to be NCAA tournament related unless somebody wants to go off the board and go college baseball. Or, heck, we can go MLB. we hey, got I, game I, number two coming up tomorrow. I won an European Football League 2 bet yesterday <laughs> based upon somebody I follow on social media. They had said, pick this one, and I was like, all right, I'll just trust you. I have no idea what I'm doing. But it worked. One. All right, well, maybe Bobby will come back with some more of that good mojo on the other side we'll wrap up the show with that this is hoist the colors on a wednesday air service is back at pitt greenville airport offering safe clean facilities and flights from american airlines that means the short commute quicker lines and better prices that get you where you're going fast and easy see it for yourself there's great things inside at pitt greenville airport Storm season is approaching. North Carolina weather can damage your roof, and before long, a small leak can turn into a big problem. Your home is one of your biggest investments, so protect it with Wells Home Improvements. We work with all insurance companies for a hassle-free roof installation experience. Call us today and get 10% off your roof installation when you mention this commercial. 252-227-8403 or visit us online at wellshomeimprovements.com. Wells Home Improvements, local, honest, dependable. Get ready for an unforgettable experience at the first annual Mid-Atlantic Hunting and Fishing Expo happening in Greenville, North Carolina on March 23rd and 24th. Explore a wide array of exhibits showcasing the latest gear, equipment, and accessories. Discover expert tips and techniques from seasoned professionals in captivating seminars. Connect with fellow outdoorsmen and immerse yourself in the world of outdoor adventure. Mark your calendars and be part of the Mid-Atlantic Hunting and Fishing Expo. Big tax credits are back. Get a 30% tax credit, up to $2,000 off your new Mitsubishi electric heat pump install. Let Comfort Master help you take advantage of the tax credits with a qualifying Mitsubishi electric ducted heat pump or non-ducted Mitsubishi electric mini splits. Mitsubishi electric mini splits are ideal for bonus rooms, garages, or sunrooms. If you need a new HVAC unit, call Comfort Master today. Call Comfort Master. Call Comfort Master. When a place is as special as this, you don't want to change a thing. You simply want to enjoy it, just as it is. That was our inspiration behind Bow Coast West, our newest community in Beaufort, North Carolina. Embrace all that we love about this very special place and make it easy for families to enjoy all that this coastal lifestyle has to offer. Be inspired. Bow Coast West. Hey, grab me one, too. Air Service is back at Pitt Greenville Airport offering safe, clean facilities and flights from American Airlines. That means the short commute, quicker lines, and better prices that get you where you're going fast and easy. Here there be There's pirates. Back to hoist the colors with Stephen I go. How good is this? On 94.3, the game. All right, welcome back in. Got a few minutes left. We're going to debut our bets of the week. Before we do that, East Carolina, ladies and gentlemen, is recruiting DJ Burns from the transfer portal. 
Not the NC State, DJ Burns, but Youngstown State for DJ Burns, who averaged 13 points, 11 rebounds, is in the portal. And according to the portal ret- uh, report on X, East Carolina has reached out. So maybe the Pirates can get their own version of DJ Burns. All right, bets of the week. Who wants to start it off? We got about a minute left, so we'll have to go quick. I'll shoot it first. I got mine lined up. Mississippi State over Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State is favored, and I like Mississippi State in that matchup at plus 100 taking the money line what you got phil um Giannis is out tonight celtics been taking care of business they're 10 and a half point favorites you just don't like to bet that big of a thing but with no Giannis for the bucks give me the celtics going to nba i like it i'm a little surprised i i, I just i feel like there is if you know nba there's some money to be made there if you know that market but i just don't feel comfortable enough venturing into nba um so I've got a few picks already for the NCAA tournament. You know, James Madison is a popular pick. I've got them at plus 185 on the money line to beat Wisconsin. I'm going to go a little off the radar here, though. I'm going to go Utah State. I've watched TCU a lot this year, and I know they had some big wins, but I like Utah State. I think they're a very good team. That's one of the 8-9 games. Historically, the underdog in the 8-9 game advances, I think, more than 50 percent of the time in, in most recent years yeah it's they're like 78 and 73 all time no this number would have to be an even number but either right. way it's something around those 78 and 72 all time since the tournament expanded to 64 plus teams i'm going to utah state there plus that's a 10 o'clock tip off so it'll give me a reason to stay up late <laughs> uh, but no i like utah state as my bet of the week money line and i uh, believe that is plus 154 so we'll try and do our bets of the week each week going forward every Wednesday. Again, I want to incorporate some betting talk now that it's legal in NC, but not overtake the show with it. So we'll introduce that little by little. All right, guys, this has been fun. Bobby, appreciate it, man. Yep. I- Philip, uh, <laughs> appreciate you <laughs> behind the scenes as well. Uh, John Gilbert tomorrow, 12 noon. We'll talk to you then. This has been Hoist the Colors with your host, Stephen Igo. Tune in weekdays at noon for all things ECU sports. Get a recap of the show at 943thegame.com on Twitter.